<laughs> All right, I want to talk a little bit about some of the great lessons uh, that I've imparted from the book, uh, but begin with a, with this kind of a simple question: that uh, what narrative of what I what I affectionately refer to uh, tongue in cheek as the cocktail party crowd in Washington D.C. What narrative that they have about the war in Iraq do you most hope to change with this book? Well, you know, it, what happens is that the people who are not involved on the inside tend to write articles in the newspapers and go on television and talk about it. And there are people who I'm sure are trying to do a good job, but they end up reflecting what they think and not what is known or what actually occurred. Uh, what I'm trying to do with this book, uh, rather than writing a quick book in a year and, and doing it from memory, uh, I've spent four years uh, digitizing my archive and then going through it carefully, talking to people from OMAS. Oh, I mean, we must have had 20, 30, 40, 50 people come in and, and discuss their recollections and their perceptions. And then we'd gone back to the documents and written a book that I think is, is, is rooted in the facts, and, and, and the facts are there on the website. Uh, so I hope that people will read it. I hope they'll come away with, with a, um, an understanding of, of the complexity of those decisions, the, the, uh, the, the way the decisions are made, the reality that many of those decisions are made with incomplete information, which is of necessity the case, that there are, in fact, unknown unknowns out there that, that uh, uh, we simply don't even know we don't know. Uh, and that, that they will read this and see this slice of history and, and benefit from it and then make their own judgments. And w when they do, w where do you think they'll say, uh, you know what, maybe, maybe that, that theory I have, that narrative, if I will, on Iraq is, is flawed? W w w w what? Well, I think that'll be the case. I think people, you know, people are honest, and, and what they do is when, when they hear something in one ear, then they have no reason to disbelieve it. They, they'll tend to think, well, maybe that's the case. But if they have a, a, a series of books that, that give different slices of history that are somewhat different than that narrative that many people get invested in, and then have the documents they can go to and read the full document, my guess is that people will find that persuasive. And you, you're not uncritical of, of the administration you served in about Iraq. Or myself. Yeah, and, and, and gone through a number of those things. And one, I think, is you know, a narrative that you hear is that you rushed to war, and, and you know, basically most of the criticism is directed at the post-war Iraq period, mm -hmm. uh, you know, by the, the chattering class, if you will. Uh, and you really define why that happened. You know, uh, there's obviously natural tensions between defense and, and state always, but, you know, you had essentially uh, some, some battles along the way that, in your, in, in your view, in the end, as I read this book, the Common Sense Club chairman that I am says, you know what, uh, uh, too many academics were, were, were you know, navel-gazing a little bit and not, not ultimately putting to the President of the United States uh, a black and white decision to make that ultimately was very costly in post-war Iraq. Is that a fair reflection? Well, the, the, the people involved are honorable people. They are competent and capable people. And they, they, each person was, was interacting with the President in, in a way that was perfectly responsible. And the result was there were differences of opinion, as there always been in different administrations. I've been around here since Eisenhower was president, and we, we know that, that that's inevitable, that people are going to have different views, and that's healthy. That's not unhealthy. And the president made his decisions, and, and uh, in some cases the, the decisions were made in a crisp way, and he was perfectly willing to step up and make those tough decisions. In other instances, decisions uh, were dragged along for a period, and in some instances, I think that was unfortunate. Uh, I, I use one example, the pace at which responsibility was turned over to the Iraqi government and the Iraqi people. And I favored a more rapid turnover, and, and others favored a slower turnover. And I felt that the slower turnover probably contributed to the development of the insurgency because uh, the insurgents could be seen as being against um, the coalition forces and instead of the, the insurgents being seen against a, an Iraqi government that had been elected. Time will tell, you know, the road not taken is always smoother and, uh, and life goes on. But what to, on that point, if the Rumsfeld way had prevailed, and really what you're saying is this idea that, you know, you talk candidly about uh, Condoleezza Rice and your admiration for her, but you also talk about the notable feature of her sort of style was that mediator, that sort of blending differences, and that doesn't serve a country in the middle of a war well, is what I, what I take away from it. So if, if your way had been presented, 
directly to the president rather than you know blending differences before they get there, how would it have been different? How would Iraq been different, do you believe? We didn't go down that road. So uh, I could make the case that life would have been better and that it would have been a smoother road, but I can't prove that. And, and uh, the consequence of that would have been what? Less, uh, less of a difficult sell to the American public? No, I think there might have been... Uh, my fear, theory was, and the recommendation of a lot of the neighboring countries and even some people in the country was, look, put an Iraqi face on this soon. Move, move the responsibilities as rapidly as possible over to the Iraqi people and, and their governing council uh, so that they will have a responsibility and begin to develop the skill sets to, to, to manage their country. And, and so that the insurgents can't go around saying, look, the Americans are there, they're occupying our country, they're there to steal our oil, which was totally untrue. But that was, that was the drumbeat. And, and so people uh, on the ground, the coalition provisional authority, had the responsibility for making some tough decisions. And, and we at our level had a responsibility to make our recommendations to the president, which we did. And the president had the responsibility to make decisions, which he did. And, you know, if, if you net it out, you know, some of the decisions were good, some were less good. But overall, this country has not been attacked for close to a decade. And George W. Bush deserves an enormous amount of credit for putting in place a set of structures that put pressure on terrorists and those that would kill innocent Americans. And, and those structures, after two years of a new administration that criticized every one of them, criticized Guantanamo, criticized military commissions, criticized indefinite detention, they're still there. Why? Because they probably were very important in protecting this country, is my judgment. Let's talk about Afghanistan, speaking of narratives. One is, you know, had Osama bin Laden right there at our grasp and, and let him go, the old Tora Bora thing. What, what, uh, what narrative on a, in Afghanistan is most wrong, do you believe? Well, you know, uh, the, there's no question but that uh, Osama bin Laden had in the past used Tora Bora. There was speculation. I don't never saw anything that was conclusive, but there was clearly speculation that he was either there or moving through, through there en route to Pakistan early on in our efforts in Afghanistan. Um, our Air Force and Navy planes bombed Tora Bora, and so the rubble was bouncing. I mean, I don't know how many tons of weapons were unloaded on that area. Uh, clearly, that was not successful. We had uh, special forces on the ground and some regular forces. We were working with a group of Afghans called the Eastern Alliance, and they were pursuing Osama bin Laden, or what they thought was probably Osama bin Laden. And we asked at our level uh, repeatedly, do you need, what do you need more of? And do you need more troops? And I never got any recommendation from down below through George Tenet or General Franks uh, that they wanted more U.S. troops or more U.S. bombing or more U.S. anything. Uh, we, we asked the question, should we be doing more? Is there something else we can be doing? It certainly would be desirable to capture or kill him. And, uh, and in each instance, uh, the Central Intelligence Agency and, and the Central Command made judgments at the senior levels, at least, that we were doing what we should be doing. Uh, those are tough calls. I'm sure there were people down the line who had different views and who may have recommended something else might have been done, but they weren't persuasive enough to persuade up the chain of command in the agency or the chain of command in CENTCOM. And, and I must say I have to uh, say that I agreed with the decisions being made by General Franks and, and his recommendations. I agreed with what George Tennant was saying and doing, and I have no idea if there might have been a w better way to do it but, you know, that's the nature of war. There are, uh, people have different perspectives depending on where they're standing, and I don't question the, uh, the honor uh, of, of the various people who've speculated to the contrary. Talking about the future, you talk about in the book having uh, returned from giving a speech at the Truman Library, coming away with a sense of, uh, of really the world changing to, to the point that we needed to... Uh, I think your exact quote was in your memo to President Bush, today the world requires new international organizations tailored to our new circumstances. And you lament a little bit that this did not get the attention because the waning days of the administration were there and they were mired in some political battles. Um, might that be a challenge for 
you know, this president, future presidents, hopefully Republican, to maybe take that on? And, and might uh, the State Department be in part of that reform, given some of the things you point out here? Absolutely. I, I think that the reality is that in the Truman administration, a whole set of institutions were put in place at the end of the World War II and at the beginning of the Cold War. Today, we're, we're at the end of the Cold War and at, at another inflection point uh, into the 21st century, the information age, and the institutions that served us reasonably well in the past uh, 50 to 60 years need to be adjusted and modified. If you think about it back then, the, the United Nations, NATO, the World Bank, the IMF, and here at home, the National Security Council, the Defense Department, the CIA, USIA, all of those things are... Uh, uh, inheritance from the Truman era. They need to be adjusted for the 21st century. This is a totally different time. We've been engaged in the first wars of the 21st century, the first wars of the information age, and our institutions are still rooted back in the 1940s. And I hope that uh, this president and future presidents and future congresses uh, look that squarely in the face and, and address those problems and, and help our country move into this new information age. You talk in the book about Katrina and a memo that you wrote to the president eight months after Katrina in which you said the charge of incompetence against the U.S. government should be easy to rebut were people to understand the extent to which the current system of government makes competence next to impossible. <laughs> That's a profound statement. And whether it's Katrina and our response there, whether it's the economies we've talked about today and the response there to our growing debt and deficit or to, to the national security challenges and the global war on terror, what advice do you have for today's leaders and tomorrow's leaders uh, to, to get government and, and incompetence out of the same sentence? Well, I mean, if you think about it, uh, when I was at the Pentagon, uh, we had lawyers back in the 1970s. Today, there are over 10,000 lawyers in the Department of Defense. When I was there in the 70s, the Defense Appropriation Bill Authorization Bill was 74 pages. Today, the defense authorization bill is something like 500-plus pages. Now, what's happened? What's happened is that congressional staffs have exploded. There are many multiples of what they were 30 or 40 years ago. We live in a, at a time when it is government is so big and so complex that, that any one thing is not important. All the reports that are required, all the rules, all the requirements. Think of Gulliver in Gulliver's Travel and the Lilliputians, and they put these little bitty threads over Gulliver. No one of those was determinative, but in the aggregate, there were so many little threads that Gulliver couldn't move. And we need to take a fresh look at, at this period and see that our government is modernized to fit this new century. Uh, we're still basically a, a operating back in, in 30, 40 years ago in government, and that's not good enough. Go government can't fail. Private sector, if a, if a company gets too big, gets too slow, too ponderous, uh, unresponsive, doesn't understand its market, it dies. You walk down any street in America, next year you go by, there'll be different stores there. Why? Because people are making judgments. Not true of government. Anything that exists stays. Now, we have to be willing to look at ourselves. I recommend that there be a, back in the 40s, there was a thing called the Hoover Commission, where Republicans and Democrats were assigned, and they took an honest look at government and, and instituted a series of changes. I think we need a new Hoover Commission, a modern one for the 21st century, where serious people, bipartisan basis, look at government and say, okay, we're not mad, but Let's be honest, it's not working well. Today, getting in bed with governments like climbing in bed with a hippopotamus. It's, it's warm and good for a minute, and then the thing rolls over and crushes you, and he didn't even know you were there. <laughs> On that very profound note, we must call this wonderful conversation to a close. God bless you, sir, and uh, thank you for your wonderful service to this country. Well, thank you so much. It's been enjoyable being with you. Don Rumsfeld, the author of Known and Unknown, a great public servant to a great United States of America. Our guest today on the Common Sense Club, live from CPAC.